to uh, Faith Church Sunday School. Uh, this is our 19th time together uh, as we've gone through the, our study of Pilgrim's Progress using uh, Ligonier's material that's hosted by and, and taught by um, Derek Thomas. And, uh, and so we're going to, uh, to finish up today uh, just by way of information and next week we'll be starting a new series uh, that'll be primarily taught by uh, Greg Stoniker and he may he may teach the whole thing uh, if, if he's not called out of town for some reason but uh, that's going to be in Nehemiah so he's going to he started that study uh, last year in 2020 and um, got cut short a uh, very short he only got into a, a chapter or so of Nehemiah, and and so we're going to give him the opportunity to uh, to redo that uh, time of study in Nehemiah, which is a great study. It's a, a particularly in the life of our church today, as we consider uh, how the Lord may be leading us to uh, to grow our church uh, physically, not only as the Lord uh, blesses our church with. Uh, growth spiritually and in growth in number. Um, we're in a place of need to grow uh, physically, and we're talking about that. And so a study of Nehemiah is very appropriate at this time. And so I would encourage you not only to participate in the study yourself, but also to encourage uh, other folks in the church uh, to participate as well. Uh, with that, Let's um, turn our attentions to our study today as we come to the end of Pilgrim's Progress 2 and uh, uh, the end of Christiana's story. And uh, we're coming to, you know, the end of life in this, in this section. Before we do that, uh, one of the things before we get into that particularly, I want to read to us, just a, a reminder, as by way of reminder, from the end of the Pilgrim's Progress, the first part, and um, this is this is the point. I'm just going to read to us as a reminder um, about hopeful and Christian as they come up to the gate uh, and are enter into the celestial city. Because in Pilgrim's Progress 2, we don't get so much a description of the city as we get a description of people passing through death. So let me read this to us by way of reminder. Now, when they had come up to the gate, we're written over it in letters of gold, blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Then I saw in my dream that the shining men bid them call at the gate, the which when they did, some from above looked over the gate to wit Enoch, Moses, and Elijah, and others to whom it was said, these pilgrims are come from the city of destruction for the love that they bear to the king of this place. And then the pilgrims gave in unto them each man his certificate, which they had received in the beginning. Those therefore were carried in unto the king, who when he had read them, said, Where are the men? To whom it was answered, They are standing without the gate. The king then commanded to open the gate, that the righteous nation that keepeth truth may enter in. Now I saw in my dream that these two men went in at the gate, and lo, as they entered, they were transfigured, and they had raiment put on that shone like gold. There were also that, excuse me, there were also that met them with harps and crowns and gave them to them the harps to praise withal, and the crowns in token of honor. 
And then I heard in my dream that all the bells in the city rang again for joy and that it was said unto them, enter ye into the joy of our Lord. I also heard the men themselves that they sang with a loud voice saying, blessing, honor, glory, and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. Now, just as the gates were open to let in the men, I looked in after them and behold, the city shone like the sun. The streets also were paved with gold and in them walked many men with crowns on their heads, palms in their hands and golden harps to sing the praises with all. Beautiful passage about uh, coming in to heaven. And uh, I just wanted to read that as for you as a reminder so that we keep that in mind as we read about uh, and talk about um, the end of, of the second book. Um, as we think about the end of the second book, as we come to this crossing of the river of death uh, for the, the characters in um, the Pilgrim's Progress 2, uh, it's good that we read from uh, Isaiah, first chapter 43, verses 1 to 7, which reads this way. But now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you. I give men in return for you, peoples in exchange for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and from the west. I will gather you. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, who I, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. God speaking to the righteous nation that will enter in. Uh, and then if we turn in our Bibles to 1 Thessalonians, um, and we read in chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians, beginning in verse 13, 13 and 14, talk about the coming of the Lord. And we read this, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. You know, when people die, you know, God brings them into his presence and, uh, and praise the Lord. That's what we're talking about today. Uh, as we look at the teaching objectives for this section, uh, we're describing the process of the end of life, of departing from this life. We're looking at uh, the idea of, of celebrating the hope that awaits our that awaits us, that awaits God's people. Uh, there is hope uh, for the life hereafter. Um, it's also we want to be reminded of. Christ followers that they do not need to fear death. You know, death is a frightful thing, but we need not fear it as believers. And uh, lastly, in our objectives, it's to encourage Christians to prepare themselves for their eventual death so that they may live well and die well. And that's what we're talking about today. How do we die well? And um, so let me quote uh, from John Newton. I think you'll recognize it. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace has, 
hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. Praise the Lord. Let's pray, and then we'll listen to Derek Thomas. Father in heaven, we come before you thanking you for the blessings that are ours in Christ, thanking you for um, this life, this eternal life that we need not fear death, for we, in Christ, will be with you for eternity. And we praise you for that, and we look forward to that day when we will see Jesus face to face, that we will, particularly when Jesus comes again, we look forward to the resurrection of our body and the re-stitching together, the reconnection of our souls and bodies together in heaven when we have a glorified body um, that is really beyond our reality, beyond our understanding. Um, our reality, our truth is limited. We see through a glass darkly, but then we shall see clearly and we will be changed and we praise you for it. And so, Lord, as we take this study today, help us to, to uh, wrestle with these concepts. And I pray that you would cement these hopes and these truths into our hearts, that we would be changed by them and be a people who uh, do not fear death, but who gladly live this life to its full, uh, knowing that we will be with you in heaven. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's cut to the uh, to the video. So there you have it, um, talking about death today, and, and always when we talk about death of believers, we're talking about life, because uh, death is simply our, our transition uh, from this life uh, into the life to come. So as we are wont to do, I'm going to take us through the study questions uh, that are found in the study guide. And uh, so let's, uh, let's cover these last few questions. And uh, again, uh, as we have through the, throughout this um, study, uh, if you're interested in interacting with me uh, with questions, or if you have pertinent comments, um, or you're answering a question that I might, at, might ask, um, please do so in the chat function on your Zoom. And uh, as you do that, if you would put a little number in there to reference the, the question that you're responding to, that's very helpful. Um, so with that, let's, uh, let's read this first question. In contrast to part one, many of the pilgrims remained on the other side of the river for a long time before crossing over to the celestial city. Why would Bunyan end the story in this way? What does this element of the story say about the calling of Christians in this present life? All right, great question. And um, because, you know, we tend to think in terms of um, linear progression. And uh, as we do so, you know, Pilgrim's Progress, the first part, makes a lot of sense because Christian leaves the city of destruction and is on the journey and he goes and when he gets to the end of the journey, you know, he crosses the river and, and goes up to the celestial city. Um, and there's no, no sense in which um, there is any, um, you know, there, obviously there, there are ups and downs and trials and troubles along the way, but for the most part, it's a it's a straight shot, and and then it's over. And so, why didn't he do the same thing in Pilgrim's Progress too? Why don't we just have the company of these pilgrims going along 
you know, arrive at the river and then cross over. Um, well, I think it's important to see that he is, as he's, he's writing pastorally, he's writing to people who need to hear and understand um, that death, you know, death was not uncommon uh, to them. I mean, Bunyan's writing in the, in the 16th century, 16th and uh, into the 17th century, as we, as we look at it, I and mean, these people were very familiar with death. Death was a, was a kind of a regular part of everyday life. People died all the time. And since people did, as Derek made the point, since people did die at home, um, it was it's very much a part of everyone's life. In our day and age, you know, we have removed death from us because now people die usually in care facilities or in hospitals uh, apart from uh, the family home place. And... Um, which is a sad thing, I think. Um, the, you know, obviously it's it's convenient in a number of ways, and we don't have to get our hands dirty with all the all the care uh, that goes along with someone who is uh, declining and dying. Um, and you know, that's not. I don't say that to condemn anyone, um, but it's just. I think a a matter of where we are in our culture. And so um, I think it's important for us to see the progression in the in this part of the journey that they do stay at the edge of the river for a while. There, you know, there's still life left to live uh, when they get there. And um, so there's still, in a sense, in one sense, there's the ongoing journey of life that is, is happening while they're waiting uh, for the post to come uh, that's calling them home. Uh, and, and so they're still living. They're still, you know, walking the Christian walk, uh, living the Christian life. Um, and we'll see at the end, I mean, they were going to leave, leave the four boys and their, their wives and children uh, continuing to live the Christian walk. Uh, they don't get called across the river uh, in the book. So um, I think that's important for us to see that, you know, death comes at different times for different people. Um, and so... Why does this element of the story was say about the calling of Christians in this present life? We're to live our life every day. We don't know what tomorrow will bring. And we're to live our life following Jesus to the full. Um, because, you know, I'm not, I'm not guaranteed tomorrow. In fact, you know, if you look at the hard, the hard truth is I'm not guaranteed my next breath. And it's always a, a blessing to take that next breath. Um, it's always a blessing to wake up in the morning. Um, so keep that in mind as, as we are called. I mean, it's a call to discipleship, um, to follow Jesus, to take up our cross and follow him. And uh, that's not a, an easy thing. It's not an easy life that we're called to, but it's a, it's a good and abundant and um, full and fruitful life that we're called to. All right. Any questions uh, concerning part one or you know, that first question? Hearing none, uh, we'll press on. If you do have questions, you know, send them in. Number two, because of Christian's faith, his family went in one generation from being an unbelieving family to being a family with a Christian heritage. What hope does this offer for lost or broken homes today? This is a powerful, 
powerful question. And it's a beautiful question um, because herein lies hope. Um, herein lies hope because Christian didn't see uh, the fruit of his life necessarily other than to experience it individually, to experience it personally. But it is through his testimony and it's in his, through his life that the Lord uses that witness um, to bring his wife and children and others uh, into a saving faith. Uh, I think it's, it's one of the interesting themes throughout the second part of, of Pilgrim's Progress is everywhere they go, people have heard of Christian. They've heard of this great pilgrim who's on his way to the celestial city. Uh, he is remembered well, and um, his life bore much fruit. Uh, and, and I think that's an exciting thing to see. And as we think about our own families, as we think about um, maybe spouses or children or parents or brothers or sisters um, and, and extended family that don't know the Lord, you know, we don't know how God's going to use us, he's, how he's going to use the words that we speak, how he's going to use our lives maybe uh, to be a godly example uh, for others and how they may see us, and it may not be, I mean, we may not experience it. I mean, I think that's one of the great things about this, about this, uh, this whole theme here in the two books, is that Christian never experiences the joy of seeing his family or his children walking with the Lord. Um, he goes to his grave not knowing, um, but he goes to his grave faithfully. And in that, you know, his family's converted. Uh, so that's a, that's a beautiful thing. And so there is great hope and encouragement in that as we are concerned for our loved ones who don't know the Lord. Um, Any questions on that? Well, we had a uh, yeah, comment that came in. Uh, given the relative of old ages of, or, you know, relative old ages of people die, coupled with the isolation of the dying, I have been struck recently at the number of people with whom I have uh, connection who have died in the past year and at reasonably young ages. Uh, fortunately, many of them have been uh -huh. That was a comment from Jim. Uh, yeah, I mean, again, we don't know the day or the hour, and um, it's surprising, shocking sometimes um, to see people die, and, and particularly when they die young, because, because of our, our technological advancements, because of um, the, the prosperity of the culture in which we live, um, because of the, the medical uh, care that we have throughout life, um, you know, you, you know as well as I that apart from pretty, you know, unusual events or uh, unusual disease uh, of some sort, um, people tend to, to live a good long time. Um, you know, it's, and of course the, the older I get, the, uh, the younger, uh, old age seems to be, um, so it's not uncommon, you know, you kind of expect once somebody gets into their eighties, uh, and certainly into their nineties, it's not a, not a surprise when, um, they die, um. But the older I get, the you know the more surprising it is when I hear about someone who's in their early seventies dying, um, which you know in, in some parts of history, I mean, 
in, in Bunyan's day, you know, if you were in your 70s, I mean, you were among the few that made it to that age. And in our, in our day and age, you know, many, many make it to, to that age and beyond. And so um, it's, we're kind of shocked at times when we see younger people dying um, and it, we're surprised by it. Um, but that kind of thing was not a surprise, certainly in, the, in Bunyan's day, um, people died all the time in, in various, various ways, um, not only from disease, which was rampant, uh, but also from just hard living, um, not having the, you know, industrial, uh, and we weren't really talking about an industrial society then, but, you know, farming accidents and that kind of thing uh, were in ship, you know, if you were in the shipping industry, um, it, was, it was just technologically a different time and uh, a much more dangerous time in many ways. Um, but coming back to the, to the concept of the encouragement of a godly life, you know, seeing fruit uh, born in, you know, an extended family um, is, is, a, is a major theme here, and it's a beautiful theme, and it's an encouraging theme for all of us, because all of us can think of someone in our family somewhere, and maybe many in our family. I mean, I know people who, you know, they're the only believer in their whole family. And, um, you know, they, they have a burden, uh, rightly so. They have a burden for those in their family that they love. And uh, they want to see those loved ones know Jesus. And um, so this is a, a, an encouragement and a call to us not only to pray for them, but also to lead godly lives before them. Let's go to number three. Which of the characters in this story do you most identify with? How has God used this study to teach you more about yourself and your own journey of faith? Um, this is a question that, you know, as an individual, this is one of those questions that they ask often that, that it's really, it's an individual question. You have, really have to answer it on your own. Um, so for me to answer it for you as a group uh, is a little awkward, but um, I, think it's, I think it's important as, I, as I'm introduced again and again to various characters in Pilgrim's Progress. And I've been through Pilgrim's Progress a number of times now. This is the first time I've been through Pilgrim's Progress too. Uh, so these characters are, are a lot more fresh uh, in my experience. But as I'm introduced to these characters, I think one of the brilliant things about, um, or one of the genius, you know, of Bunyan's genius here in, in writing this, um, this story is we connect to the characters in ways we you know, there, there are characters where it's like, oh, I know that guy. You know, I, I've met that guy. Um, or there are things, times when it's unsettling because, ooh, that's kind of describing me. Um, and that's kind of exposing me in a way I don't want to be exposed as, you know, because I don't want to be that guy. Um, and hopefully, as you've read the book, I mean, you've had that experience because, that's one of the, the great experiences of reading this book. That's one of the, the uh, benefits uh, for discipleship wise of reading Pilgrim's Progress is, is you know, wrestling with the characters and, um, and seeing, you know, good aspects of people and, uh, and good things and, and seeing maybe some of those things reflected in our own lives and being encouraged by that. And also seeing those things that may be not so encouraging that uh, we need to be praying about and asking God to change in us because we see that reflected in, in one of the characters. Um, you think, oh man, I, I kind of am that way. Um, and the characters here, it's an interesting group. 
Um, Christiana is, is definitely a heroine. Uh, she is definitely a, a stalwart and strong in her faith. Um, having not obviously not started out that way, but you know, once she's converted, I mean, she's pretty solid the whole way through. And, um, and we don't hear much about her individually. Um, but, uh, but she is a, a great character, a, a strong and faithful character. And, um, but then there's people like, um, oh, Mr. Uh, Ready to Halt. Um, and, you know, you, you see these kind of characters and you think, wow, Mr. Feeble Mind, Mr. Despondency. Um, people with doubts, people with fears, people who suffer with depression, um, people who, you know, are always afraid. Um, and, and you think, you know, wow, that's so reflective of the church. That's so reflective of the people that are all around us in the church and God brings all kinds and the church is to minister to all kinds. Um, praise the Lord. That's, you know, we, you know, the, I, I think that's part of the beauty of this second thing is, is seeing these different people knowing their character and, and seeing how they transition, uh, their final words, uh, how they transition in the, from this life to the next. And uh, how they let go of the the mortal um, human failings and frailties um, to pass over the river and to uh, a life that has none of those things. Uh, what an encouragement! Um, what a beautiful, beautiful thing that is. So I'm not going to tell you which character I identify with. I, you know. I would certainly love to be, um, you know, Great Heart uh, or Mr. Stand Fast. Um, those kinds of characters. Uh, that's, you know, here here are godly characters uh, that that are held up and and um, show us and really ex are examples of of Christian living and and who follow Christ uh, faithfully. And um, that's who I want to be. Uh, I wouldn't say that, I, you know, that's who I am, certainly. But uh, anyway, I hope you enjoy those characters and wrestle with them and, uh, and think about them and, and ponder your own life as well. <clears throat> now, number four, if God were to call you to go to him now, would you be ready I remember uh, being told in seminary that preachers have to be, you know, there's three things that are important um, for us day to day as, as pastors and preachers. And that is, you know, we, we need to always be ready to preach, always be ready to pray, and always be ready to die. And um, that's, a, that's something that we all of us as Christians need to be ready to bear witness to the hope that is within us. And we need to be ready to go meet Jesus face to face. And that's how we're called to live. Um, you know, the, there are a number of parables and we'll get to them. Uh, some of these parables left in Matthew uh, dealing with these things you know, coming, you know, the time is coming. The time is short. Um, you know, you think about the parable of the virgins um, and having, keeping oil ready to, for your lamp uh, so that you're ready when the Lord comes. We don't know when he's coming. We don't know when he's going to call. Again, you know, I've said it before, you know, I don't know that I'm not guaranteed my next breath. I'm not guaranteed to wake up in the morning. You know, I could drive out of here this, this afternoon and be hit by a bus. Um, and those kinds of things happen. And, 
you know, am I living in a way that I am ready to face that? Am I ready to be, to enter into the presence of the Lord? Well, the question becomes, are you a believer? Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Uh, have you, you know, renounced your own righteousness and accepted his righteousness as your own? Uh, have you repented of your sins? Uh, are you trusting him alone for your eternal life? Those kinds of questions we need to answer, and we need to answer today. Um, you need to know, uh, because if you don't know, that's no way to live. That's living in fear. That's living in, um, and if you don't know, you don't know, and, and that's a scary place to be. Uh, in First John, um, the Apostle John writes, these things are written, you know, he's speaking about the scripture. These things are written that you may know that you have eternal life. Um, so the Bible is full of things that, that give us evidence that, yes, these things are true, and yes, you, if you believe these things, if you're trusting in these things, you do have eternal life. Um, and if that's not true of you, uh, if you don't understand those things, then come talk to me as the pastor or one of the elders, uh, one of the other, you know, pastors of the flock. And uh, we're happy to talk to you about these things so that you do know. And uh, part of pastoral ministry is, is continuing uh, because People are faced with life, and life has its ups and downs, and sometimes there are doubts and fears that we all face, and um, that's why we have the church. We come alongside one another as brothers and sisters in Christ and encourage one another, and so uh, let's do that together here at Faith Church. Uh, thank you for traveling with us on this uh, journey through Pilgrim's Progress. I hope that you find Pilgrim's Progress to be a joy and an inspiration and an encouragement to you uh, throughout the rest of your life, however long that may be, however long the Lord uh, leaves you here to serve him. Uh, with that, let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your great grace. Thank you for our Savior. Thank you that we have life in him and that abundantly and all because you have called us to yourself you have changed our hearts you have taken away our heart of stone given us a heart of flesh you have given us an understanding of our great burden of sin our need for a savior and you have provided that savior for us in jesus and we you've taken the burden off our backs and dealt with it at the cross and put it away. And you've called us to this great journey of the Christian life to be fruitful for your kingdom's sake. Lord, work mightily in us to that end. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for being here. God bless you.
Thank you.